King, comforter of the spirit, mm -hmm. and the of our president, for us all things, mm -hmm. treasure, blessings, and giver of life. Come and abide us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls with it. Okay. So, are there any are there any questions from last week? There got to be some questions. The book of Margaret Barker is very expensive. Yeah. Seventy dollars. Seventy dollars? No. A hundred? Yes. Oh, but then, then don't. Unless you've already go, gone for it. Yeah. Wife probably wouldn't be too too happy about that. No, no, she would not. Christmas. <laughs> well, I mean, we can we can just use, and what's important is to just have a good text of the book. And all the rest we can develop. So, um, on the other hand, if you want to buy some, su get some supplementary material, um, there's there are books that have, um, like the lost books of the Bible and things like that. Um, some has some of these books that were excluded from the canon, but which constitute the, the context of the contemporary literature around the time of the New Testament. Um, and so some of those are interesting, specifically the Apocalypse of, um, of Moses, the, the Ascension of Moses, the Book of Jubilees, um, uh, of course the Book of Enoch, and you can actually download all of those, and so they're and they're they're pretty. Book of Enoch is 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 actually fairly important, um, and it's you know even though it's quoted in the New Testament, you know somehow it got excluded from uh, from the canon. Of course, it's also pretty weird, and it's pretty weird mythology, and. Um, it's like a super extended um, uh, genesis. So, yeah. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the Apocrypha? Well, we don't have an Apocrypha in the Orthodox Church. We have, we have the um, second, can the, uh, uh, the broader canon. And so for us, what the Protestants call the Apocrypha, which are... What does it mean? Apocrypha means... Um, kind of... Uh, I don't... It's something, it's something to do with, with the hidden, hidden books or something like that. Basically what they are is they're books that were excluded by the Jews... Uh, from the canon of the Masoretic text, uh, because they uh, that were in the Septuagint and were in common usage at the time of, of, of Jesus, but the Jews excluded them. Um, you know, a couple hundred, hundred, hundred and fifty years later, um, partly because they were they had so many references to Christ, you know, that the Christians were using, um, and also they were not written in Greek, or they were not written in Hebrew, they were written in Greek for the most part. And so these includes parts of Daniel, the book of Maccabees, um, uh, 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 wisdom books, um, and, uh, and so there's, there's a whole bunch, you know, there, there's a number of, of books that are in the Orthodox canon of Scripture, and most of which are also in the Catholic canon of Scripture, but the Protestants don't use them because they use they use a Jewish Bible as opposed to the Bible that was uh, uh, in use by the apostles, which is the Septuagint. And after following the uh, fall of Jerusalem in the year seventy, the the Jews did radical editing. Of uh, of the scriptures 
and um, edited out many different texts that uh, were being used by the Christians as uh, proofs of, of Christ's divinity. So, um, so for the Orthodox, uh, for Christians, um, the Masoretic text, which is the basis of the entire English biblical tradition, um, is an unacceptable book because basically it's edited with an anti-Christian bias. Um, whereas uh, the Old Testament that we use is the Septuagint, which was translated into Greek in the, around the year 270 BC and re- thus reflects a much older version. Masoretic text, you know, they started, they, start, they put it together around the year 100 AD, and then they kept editing it over the next thousand years, actually, um, whereas the Septuagint is very early. Yeah? What translations are safe? None. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I just got that book today. Which one? Which one? The one I ordered as far as which translation mm-hmm. is the best. And it says the Orthodox Study Bible. Really? Uh, that's the one I use. Really? Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's ortho- I've worked on the Orthodox Study Bible. Okay. So I know the ins and outs of that. Um, the Orthodox Study Bible is based on the New King James, which is not a bad translation. It's free of a lot of the, like the, what, New International Version, and it's, that's, that's all full of Protestant theological bias. bias. Um, and so it's not acceptable. And then you've got um, paraphrases according to evangelical so pseudo theology and in all sorts of things like the Living Bible and stuff and none of that's acceptable. Um, the two better translate probably the two best translations um, are um, the of the uh, broad market are RSV, the old RSV, which is and especially the Catholic version coming out of Ignatius Press, um, or the the New King James. The old King James is good, but but people have a hard time understanding the language. Um, in the monastery, I knew we were in trouble when the brothers decided that um, it was impious to use some of the language, so they converted all the U's to the, the, thy, and thou. Of course, they didn't understand the, the difference that you is plural. And, and thou is singular. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, but people who are, who are not familiar with the language, they just don't get it. Um, and so it, that, that didn't work. And there's a lot of archaicisms in the old King James. And the new King James is basically just an updating. Um, now, the Orthodox Study Bible version is an updating of the Old Testament according to the Septuagint. Um, it includes translations of, um, of the texts oh, of the texts that are not in the, uh, um, uh, in the Masoretic, um, the so-called Apocrypha, um, and, um, and also the variations where the, where the text is different. Um, from the uh, uh, in in the Septuagint versus the Masoretic, um, and so, uh, but the but the New Testament of of the Orthodox Study Bible is straight New King James, without alteration. So, um, for better or worse, um, the RSV uh, was the was the. Uh, version that we used in in seminary. You have to put it in B, not in A. I tried that. No. I tried A. This is no memory card. No memory card. Was that A or B? That was A. 
It's saying uh, initialize only using the camcorder. Anyway, technical difficulties. In the What's modern that? time, we can try we were like time. 200 years ago, we wouldn't worry we're about working? this. Right. That's, right. That's right. 50 years ago, 30 years ago, <laughs> we couldn't <laughs> worry about it. We could try using a phone, I'm just not sure how much memory we have. But it's your registry, anyway. Yeah, we're not thinking yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, you could. I, I know there's plenty of them around here, but I have no idea how to <laughs> how to download it. I do. Okay. So anyway, um, did that did that help? the The old RSV is 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 pretty good. Um, the Catholic edition is is better than the old RSV. Um, and they have some of the broader canon. So um, now there's another there's another small uh, edition um, from a monastery in Buena Vista, Colorado, Holy Apostles Convent, and um, it's just called the Orthodox Bible or the Orthodox New Testament, and it it reads like somebody's Greek homework, um, because it. All of the all of the tenses of the verbs are translated exactly according to how the tense is supposed to be, which is a little less than fluent. It's a lot less than fluent, um, but it's very accurate. Okay. You ready? Yeah, you got it. Okay, are you going to have to hold it like that? Oh, okay. So, anything else? Okay. Um, so, uh, one of the... Talking about catechesis, um, I think... Uh, I think I hope I got the, uh, the message across that I really think catechesis... Um, is not just about conveying data. It's not just about um, learning about the structure of the uh, oops, the structure of the church, and you know, and of the liturgies, and the history, and the theology, and you know, and 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 all of this other stuff. All that's important. It's valuable, but um, is it? But but there's there's much more to it. And one of the biggest problems I think that we have, and um, uh, somebody somebody brought it up, you know, we can focus on all of this intellectual, rational data and um, rational understanding, but what's really important is the the experience of faith, um, and faith is beyond rational. There's two, two. There's an important distinction that you find in English, anyway, between belief and faith. And belief is propositional. Belief, is, you know, that you believe in certain things, in con and basically in concepts, uh, conceptual images, all of all of these things. You believe in doctrine. You believe in the organization. You believe in the, you know, the structure of the church. You believe in the sacrament. All of that kind of stuff. But faith is on a different level. And, and the fundamental distinction is, is that belief is rational. It's the knowledge of the head. Whereas faith is the knowledge of the heart. In other words, it's noetic perception. It's the direct perception of God. And it's about our living experience of communion with God. It's not about um, uh, simply about some kind of uh, uh, attending church where they, they do things differently than they do in other churches. Well, you want the, in the Orthodox Church, you can, you can take it that way, 
you know, and just live your life as if, um, you know, as if nothing happened except you go to a different church where the services are longer and maybe the food is better, <laughs> you know, at coffee hour. But, um, but there's a lot more to it and there's a lot more to orthodoxy than um, the... Uh, is it hopeless? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. There's a lot more to orthodoxy than just um, uh, learning about the data of the faith and, you know, and how it all fits together. And so what we really need to do is develop our faith. And that faith is the knowledge of God. And it's not knowledge about God. It's the knowledge of God um, as person. And, um, and it's precisely this that is that is the most uh, central thing in the, in the revelation of Jesus Christ, that it's Jesus revealed God as our Father. He re- revealed God as person and not simply as uh, a concept. Um, uh, you go into the, the radical monotheisms of Judaism or, or Islam, and you can't really say that it's a personal deity because he's not a person is always defined by relationship so in christianity we have the concept of of a personal god who is the father who has with him his son and his spirit and he's in relation to the son and the spirit and he's in relation to us and um, and our relation and and he relates to us as 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 father and we as his as his children. Um, you don't really have that same kind of relationship um, in Judaism or Islam. Um, God is more of a concept, um, and he can be a pretty distant concept. You know, certain schools of Judaism, for example, like the Sad the the Sadducees. Who were the um, uh, who were the pre the essentially the keepers of the temple? Um, they basically believed that uh, God was some kind of solitary monad, some kind of philosophical. Wait, wait, wait! He talked to them. Well, at, at <laughs> one point, <laughs> yeah. He but he to talked to the in, yeah. In the Bible, he talked to them. Right. So it's not a concept. Well. It, he talked to Moses. He spoke. He spoke to Moses. He didn't speak to them. He's, and so, and so, it, the way it evolved, times. the way to, the way the way things evolved, um, you had the Pharisees who would believe that yes, God talked to God, relates to people. But then there's this other aspect, which was a very important aspect of Judaism. I mean, the 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 priests in the temple who were the Sadducees. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, were um, uh, you know they were some of the major leaders of the religion and they didn't believe in spirits they didn't believe in souls they didn't believe in angels they didn't believe in life after death they didn't believe in any of that stuff they didn't believe in judgment he spoke to the prophets right but were th- were the Sadducees responsible for writing those books? I don't think so. And so, and so, what? And did they believe them? Not Obviously the, not. Not all, not all the time. Obviously not. You know, whereas uh, the Pharisees did believe the scriptures, um, much, much in a very different way. It was, you know, there was this weird dynamic going on, and how the Pharisees and Sadducees got along, God only knows. It, apparently they didn't, if you, if you read the New Testament fairly, or the surrounding literature. There was a kind of a... Um, or, or in Islam, yeah, God, God spoke to um, Muhammad, allegedly, through an angel. God didn't speak to Muhammad. Yeah, but I'm mostly talking about the, the Jewish... Right. They gave us God, in a way. 
The Hebrews did. The Hebrews did. Okay. The Jews didn't. The, the Hebrews, Hebrews did. did. Okay. Really yeah, there's a, and there's a, and that's an important distinction. Um, Hebrew, the Judaism didn't appear until 500 A.D. It's my mistake. Yeah. So. Um, Can you talk more about that? Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, that's a, that's an, that's another class. Um, so anyway, when we're talking about faith, at, uh, we're also talking about, and thus the, the class has dealt with, um, uh, the discipline of the faith. And, and the disciplines of the, of the church are there to help nurture our faith. So we've talked about prayer and fasting. We've talked about um, uh, living a, a moral life. We've talked about, um, you know, all, well, all the various disciplines that the, that the church puts on us. And one of the most important disciplines is that of prayer. Um, and there's two aspects to, uh, to prayer. One is, one is the common prayer of the, of the whole body, and then there's the private prayers. Um, now, the common prayer, meaning uh, the liturgical services, meaning matins and vespers, and, um, and also uh, especially the liturgy and the sacraments, on one hand. And on the other hand is, is our own private prayers. Now, this includes everything from prayer book prayers, um, Everybody knows the Jordanville prayer book, right? And that's that's just kind of the standard, um, uh, especially in Rokor, um, and as a as a discipline of prayer. But the discipline, but the practice of prayer, and especially uh, if you look more broadly within the tradition, and especially if you look to the places where they specialize, as it were, uh, in prayer in the monasteries. Um, especially in the great centers of monasticism, um, uh, the focus is not so much on the discipline of um, the the daily cycle of prayers um, in the prayer book. The discipline revolves primarily around the Jesus prayer. Now there are some there are still some monasteries where uh, the focus is the external. Um, the prayer book prayers and and actually a lot of those are done corporately, even though they're private prayers, um, they're still done uh, in the church um, altogether. But um, but the private prayer rule um, focuses to a great extent on the Jesus prayer. Now some people um, I've heard it said. Um, by a convert, yeah, I, you know, I came to orthodoxy hearing about the Jesus prayer and the way of a pilgrim and, and all of this uh, spirituality of the philokalia, and I came and nobody did it and nobody talks about it. Nobody does it and nobody talks about it. Um, well, it's not that nobody does it, and uh, it's just that they don't talk about it if they do it. Uh, because it is the tradition of the church <laughs> yeah it is the tradition of the church that you don't talk about your own spiritual life um, except to your spiritual father you don't get together and share with your friends how your progress is on prayer and you know how you can measure your progress and you know um, which always reminds me of uh, this one one priest, he was part of the evangelical orthodox movement, he'd been a leader in campus crusade, and he said when I was an evangelical I knew that I was on the 99th percentile of spirituality mm, <laughs> nice <laughs> I had my daily I had my daily quiet time, I had my scripture readings, I did all of these things, and when I became orthodox, I realized that I was basically Barely at the first percentile <laughs> on spirituality. Yeah. Um, so we have a little bit different approach um, than 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 the evangelicals do, like radical. 
Um, and uh, not, that we, not that we can't also fall into the temptation of thinking that I'm at the 99th percentile of spirituality, um, but it's a lot more difficult if you pay any attention to what you're reading. Um, um, because the, the tradition of the church is basically to obliterate that kind of an attitude. Um, uh, so we've got the, there's, um, it's, a, it's a very good thing and, and a very valuable thing um, to uh, learn the discipline of uh, uh, of the of the daily prayers from the prayer book, and what it does is it helps to form your mind, teaches you how to pray, teaches you how to pray in, in the way of the fathers, and and forms your soul, forms the atti- the attitudes within. Um, and so, for example, in, in Russian monasteries, um, uh, the Jesus prayer is not given to novices. The Jesus prayer is only given to, uh, to people who have already um, uh, attained to a certain degree of experience in the spiritual life. Um, and usually that means that they've already uh, been tonsured to the first level of monastic life, which is, which is Razafor which is really a glorified novice, but it's kind of, they're all dressed up. Anyway. Um, uh, Nowhere to go. What's that? Dressed up. Well, they have some place to go. If they're a Razafor in a monastery, they have some place to go. Um, uh, and, and the Jesus prayer is something that takes time to learn. Now, there's an ancient tradition of the Jesus Prayer. Um, it goes all the way back to the Egyptian desert or before, which, is, which was really where monasticism was born. Um, uh, you had St. Anthony, who was the, essentially the father for the Eremitic life. You had St. Pacomius, um, who was the father of the Cenobitic life. And, and, it, and it, it grew from there. Um, and that, those were... That was the end of the third, beginning of the fourth century. Um, in the early years, uh, the fathers tended to use verses of scripture um, as for meditation. It was called monologic prayer or single phrased prayer. Um, and so, one of the verses that they would use very frequently was, "Lord, make speed to, to save me. O Lord, make haste to help me." They would repeat that. Now, a lot of the fathers in, in the Egyptian deserts were illiterate. Um, and so they, didn't, they couldn't exactly sit there and read from prayer books, service books, or even the scriptures. Um, but nonetheless, even though many, many of them were illiterate, uh, many of them were able to memorize the entire Psalter because they heard it so many times. And they knew how, and culturally, they knew how to memorize things, which is something that we've lost entirely. Um, in the early church, in order to be uh, tantra a monk, you had to have the whole Psalter memorized so that you could start, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, and, and so forth, and all the way to the end of Psalm 150. Um, it's a pretty awesome thing for... You know, from our perspective, um, but not, nothing particularly unique um, at that time. Um, so the Psalter was the Psalter was the essence of um, of the monk's prayer. Um, it also, essentially, it was the hymn book of the church long before uh, they developed all the other hymnography that we now use. And in Coptic monasteries, they still use the Psalter as the primary prayer book, um, rather than the uh, uh, books, books of hours and things like that that, that were developed in the Byzantine tradition. Uh, but 
for for those uh, hermits who um, were more isolated, they began to use other phrases from Scripture, or the or they would use the Jesus prayer. Now the Jesus the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, is. Uh, two phrases from scripture that are kind of combined. Um, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, and Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Which are both phrases in the Gospels. Um, and the, the prayer is said repetitively, con- medita- meditatively or contempt- con- <coughs> contemplatively. Now, there's a difference in, in the Christian use of these terms, which is different than the Buddhist use of these terms. Um, there's a difference between meditation and contemplation. Meditation um, involves the mind, involves the rational mind, and often uh, refers to thinking about different kinds of concepts, thinking about, you know, as pious subjects or spiritual things and um, uh, working through a, pa- a passage of scripture. That's meditation. Um, contemplation is something quite different. And contemplation um, ultimately involves the stilling of the mind. And uh, and it, it becomes a waiting on God. Um, and from this practice of, of contemplative prayer, um, there arose the practice of, uh, of Hezekiah, or Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah um, was, you know, was the, the concept of of Hezekiah as a as a form of prayer uh, was used since the fourth century. And there's even a Father Hezekias of Sinai, I think, in the first volume of the Philokalia, and 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 others. And what Hezekiah refers to is stillness, quiet or stillness, and or silence. And and the idea is that. Um, in Hezekiah's prayer or contemplation, um, you still your mind. You silence your mind. And you sit in awareness of the presence of God. Your mind or your soul? Your mind. Your rational mind. Mm. The mind has, the soul has two portions. There's the mind, meaning the rational mind, and then there's the nous, mm-hmm. uh, or the which is um, in Latin that's the intellect, but that's too confusing. We just use the mind and the nous, um, which is the um, aspect of our of our soul that perceives God directly. It's the locus of the of the of the image of God within us. Um, it's the it's the core it's it's the heart in patristic language it's the heart and so there's a, a distinction between the mind and the heart um, and in fact one of the things that if you read the literature talks about uh, the prayer of the mind descending into the heart and then the mind descending in into the heart to gar- keep guard over the heart against thoughts from the mind um, uh, so that the heart can pray. Um, this actually evolved into a very sophisticated practice. Um, and uh, uh, the, the focus of it is to learn how to control your thoughts, learn how to silence your thoughts, or not pay attention to your thoughts, and to remain in this state of rapt awareness where you're focused on the presence of God 
and ultimately are, are standing in awe of the divine presence. Um, it's not a, uh, you're not thinking about God, you're not thinking, uh, you may be thinking about, oh, I'm getting uncomfortable, but that's just a distraction. Um, <laughs> uh, you're not thinking about anything. Um, and and what what's going on is, is that you're using your mind to keep watch, to fend off thoughts which would otherwise disturb or uh, distract you from being focused on the awareness of God. And this is, this, is, this is Christian contemplative prayer. It's also what, in Greek, it's what the fathers refer to as theoria, um, in a general practice. Now, um, the Jesus prayer leads us into that because it helps us to focus our mind. Um, and the Jesus prayer, it's important to remember, it is prayer. It's not a mantra. Um, it's not a mantra that we just repeat these words, which are usually sy- syllables that we don't understand. Um, in Buddhist or Hindu meditation, it's usually the name of a, of a deity, um, which is why Hindu meditation, like yoga, um, where they give a mantra is is something unacceptable for Christians um, to practice. And this is very important because you don't want to be sitting there invoking Shiva or something, you know, um, uh, or one of the other aspects of the Hindu deities um, or demons. But rather, our focus is Jesus Christ. There's a difference between, radical difference between, so that's Hindu meditation is, you know, is the repetition of the mantra which is calling on the name of some Hindu deity, usually a demon. Um, In Buddhism, meditation consists of, um, very often of either uh, repetition of a mantra or just the practice of silence, but it's a, it's a silence in which one becomes simply completely aware of everything going around you, so that you kind of meld in with the environment. Um, uh, the practice of emptiness, the practice of mindfulness, uh, which is being taught in all sorts of schools today. Um, and it's also... It's, not as, it's certainly not as problematic as, as Hindu meditation, where you're invoking demons, um, but, uh, is, um, but it, has, it has an entirely different goal than Christian meditation or Christian contemplation, which is commun- where the goal is communion with God. Um, It looks the same externally. I mean, you're just kind of sitting there, right? <laughs> um, hopefully, with your back straight and and you know attentive. Um, but the question is, what are you attentive to? And in and in and this practice of hesychasm of hesychia is the heart and soul of the Orthodox tradition. Now, one of the uh, very important asp- things about this is that all of our doctrine, all of our theology, all of our highest levels of theology are rooted in has he cast contemplation. Because the, the fathers had attained to such a degree of spiritual awareness uh, of, of contemplative, uh, uh, in their contemplative practice, that they were able to um, somehow 
contemplate and ex- experience these mysteries, the mystery of the Holy Trinity, for example, or the Incarnation. And, and, they had, and they were also, because most of them were brilliantly educated, had the rhetorical and, and language abilities to put it into words. So our theology is not based in philosophical speculation um, where you take uh, ideas from scripture and put them all together and, and, um, and come up with a doctrine. The theology is, I, there's that aspect of it where you come, where, uh, in, where you use the language, where, which derives the language for theology from the scriptures. But on a, on a deeper level and, and, the, and the high points of theology actually come from contemplative practice of the fathers um, and, uh, and that's why for example you only have three of the great fathers three of the fathers in the entire history of the church that are called theologians St. John the, the Evangelist St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Gregory of Nazianzen, and St. Simeon the New Theologian. St. John the Evangelist, to whom Jesus showed the, the visions of the book of Revelation, that's theology. You want to know what theology is? Look at the book of Revelation. And then try and figure it out. You know? Um... It's through, um, it's through vision, which is what the word theoria means. It means vision. Um, St. Gregory of Nazianzen was able to put down language in, which expressed the thought forms that he was able to perceive <coughs> in his contemplative prayer. And St. Simeon, the new theologian, the same thing. Had a, you know, his defining um, experience was, was a vision of the living Christ. And he was in the 10th century. Um, and there are many other fathers who have had visions of Christ, but have not had the uh, rhetorical ability to put it into to uh, put the theology into words. Now in the um, in the Philokalia, um, the fathers talk about three levels um, of uh, contemplative contemplative awareness or noetic awareness. First level is called theoria. contemplation. The next level is called natural contemplation. The third level is theologia. Theologia has very little to do with the theology that you find in books, even in orthodox books, very often. And it certainly has nothing at all to do with most of the books that you find in university book uh, libraries even the theology department. Um, because true theologia is the vision of the living God, the experience of the living God. Um, as Christians, we're in, we are invited into the, ex, to the experience of the vision of the living God. This is what faith is about. Now, not everybody will have, you know, some kind of external vision. So not very few people will, actually. But most people can have an experience of God. And I think most people have an awareness of God. You know, I think about it. You walk into a church, you realize something is different. You realize it's a holy place. That's noetic vision. Uh, You go to confession and you have the world lifted off your shoulders. That's noetic vision. 
um, you, uh, you go to communion and you know that you've partaken of, of Christ's body and blood. That's noetic vision. You go, um, you're marching around the church in the middle of the night with a candle on Pascha and, um, and you know that Christ is risen. It doesn't make any rational sense. It makes absolutely no rational sense. But you know that it's true. That's noetic vision, and that's spirit, the spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding. And that is what faith is about. And, that's, and the faith is, is, is this living experience of communion with God. And it needs to be developed. Um, it's very easy um, to read all about, you know, the life of the church, all about the theology, all about the, you know, the seminary courses. You can go through all of that and not know God. When I was in seminary, I was in seminary a long time. I was there for five years. <laughs> um, uh, you know, people used to think that, well, I'm doing my spiritual reading, I'm reading my books on theology. That's spiritual reading, right? No. <laughs> That's not spiritual reading. And even, the, even reading the Bible, you can read it like a, like, a, like a textbook, or you can pray the Bible. And there's a huge difference. As Orthodox, we don't study the Bible so much as we pray it. And if you read the Bible like you read a prayer book, you're on the right track when you read, when you read from the scriptures. It's not about, um, you know, finding quotes to, to construct an argument. You know, and I think most of us know all about that, right? The Protestants especially. Mm-hmm. Well, there's plenty of Orthodox who know how to do that too. Um, but uh, so there's a place for that. There's a place for the for the external, formal, rational <coughs> knowledge. But underneath that rational knowledge, its foundation, there needs to be a living experience of faith. Um, all this has been a kind of a uh, an introduction to what uh, I would consider. Well, I I wrote a paper a number of years ago, um, quite a number of years ago actually, and it uh, derives from the teaching I received from a Greek bishop who was my spiritual father when I was in seminary. Um, Long about 1983, so what, 25 years ago? No, 35 years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bishop Callistos um, of Zelon, who uh, uh, had been a, he had been a parish priest, a celibate parish priest, and he went through kind of a crisis of faith, and so he went to Mount Athos, and there they taught him the Jesus prayer, and it saved his his vocation, and so he was able to come back. They made him a bishop. Um, it's out. Yeah. And um, uh, they and um, they assigned him to Astoria. Astoria is Greek town in New York, um, which is uh, um, there were. Something like seventy thousand Greeks living in about two square block, er, uh, two square miles, um, and uh, in Queens, and it was it was complete a completely Greek area. Um, one one of the Greek parishes actually had um, thirty five thousand people on the rolls, if you can imagine. Um, the uh, but in the middle of that, there was a little monastery um, in a brownstone operated by two natural brothers, um, Fathers Kyrillos and Eurotheos, who spoke kind of broken English um, and uh, 
they'd gotten this old brownstone. They'd, they'd taken a floor out of it. Um, and so you had this rather tall space um, for the church. And then they lived in the basement. But they not only lived in the basement, but they also operated a preschool um, as their, you know, to make money. And so, you know, and this is, this is right in the middle of Queens, right? Um, and uh, that's where I got to know, to know Bishop Colossus. It, that was my introduction to, a, uh, to Greek, kind of Greek peasant, Greek village piety, which is like 100% different from anything you'd find in, in your kind of normal GOA parish. Um, it, uh, holy chaos reigned. You know, the, the priest would do, was doing something, the cantor was doing something else. You know, the people were, were all doing other things. They were crossing themselves and bowing and prostrating, not in any kind of uh, systematic way, and each one doing their own thing at their own time. And um, so the services were unlike anything I had ever imagined in my life, I have to say. Um, but, you know, there were icons that were dripping with myrrh, you know. <laughs> there were relics that were overflowing with myrrh. There were miracles, you know, miracles happened, and, you know, and people were healed, and it was, I, this was, this, you know, this is like the real thing. Um, and so uh, what they had, I wanted. Um, I didn't really, I don't think I could pull off a service like that. <laughs> I couldn't imagine doing it. Um, uh, but, but the holiness and the sanctity was, was authentic. And, um, and, the, and the grace of the Holy Spirit was very present in and through, in that. Um, so, uh, uh, Bishop Callistos, who was, he was the bishop for the area, um, and I got to know each other. Uh, he gave a retreat, and then I went down and met with him and spent time with him down there. And he had three points in his teaching. And really what it is, it's a distillation of the spirituality you find in the Philokalia. Um, everybody knows what the Philokalia is, right? It's a book that was put together in the end of the 18th century, five volumes, um, of the writings of the fathers on, essentially on the Jesus prayer, on the Hesychast tradition. Um, and it's a, it's a guide, essentially, for spiritual fathers and monks. Um, lay people can read it if you have a blessing and somebody is, is uh, overseeing you in your... In your uh, reading of it. Um, uh, I don't advise doing what I did, um, which was um, at seminary sitting on the balcony in the sun with my feet up and a, um, <laughs> a iced tea or Coke or something like that, you know, in the summertime, <laughs> you know, and just just reading it like a novel <laughs> or something. You can't, it doesn't read like a novel in the first place. Um, and, and it's very specific directions of, of how to live and how, how to go about the discipline of prayer. And a lot of what I've talked about, um, especially in the past few days, is at least uh, presu is presumed in this. Because all that entire discipline of life, the discipline of the moral life, of the liturgical, of a, of a life lived um, that's liturgically oriented, not necessarily in a monastery, but if, you know, in, um, uh, in Russia, you know, up through the 19th century, in Byzantium, um, in villages, in, you know, throughout Eastern Europe, People lived lives that were very much uh, defined by the services of the church. 
they would stop at stop at church and go to matins on their way out to their fields, and they would stop at stop at church on their way back from the fields and go to vespers, you know. And everything was geared, you know. The 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 cycles of the church became the cycles of people's lives. You know, they would um, the church bells would ring and they uh, and they would say the hours um, by memory. Um, and that's that's not even uh, we we can't even conce- we can hardly conceive of that in our culture. Um, uh, as a bishop, I like to tell the priests: your basic job is to do the daily cycle of services. That means daily, <laughs> matins and vespers, you know, and and many and in the old world, many parishes have. Matins and vespers, and every day, and they have liturgy. And um, in in this country, that's not the case at all. We don't even con- we don't even think about that. Even even rather large cathedrals like this don't have it. Um, so, and there's probably there's there's probably a dozen places in the entire country. That have a daily cycle of services, aside from a few, aside from the monasteries. Um, but people live their lives like that. Um, one of the stories that I would I would strongly encourage you to read is the life of Saint Simeon, the new theologian, um, in the fourth volume of the Philokalia. Um, yeah, um, in which he talks about how he. Uh, how as a young man he goes searching for a spiritual father and um, he goes to this elder and he starts talking with the elder and um, the elder gives him a rule and, and he becomes very zealous in his rule and, and eventually he, he becomes a monk. Um, but he tells it in the, in the third person um, as, to, as about a, a young man named George. And... Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a kind of a snapshot of 10th century, life in 10th century Byzantium. Um, uh, now, there's the liturgical concept, there's the liturgical um, aspect of life. You know, there's, the, there's all the disciplines of you know, how we treat one another and all and the moral aspect. Um, but there's a whole set of disciplines around doing the, um, uh, around a life of prayer. Now, as I said, very early on, the, you know, the first rule of prayer that somebody should, um, should adopt would be uh, from the daily prayer book prayers, like the Jordanville prayer book morning prayers in the morning and evening prayers and, and then prayers of preparation for communion and all of that kind of stuff um, as well as going to confession and going to communion on a regular basis that's kind of your the basic discipline but on a higher level um, a more mature level of prayer um, comes the practice of uh, of the Jesus prayer and of contemplative prayer, and and this is where uh, Bishop Colossus's uh, three points kicks in. Those three points are kind of the basic foundations of of a Christian life, um, and of and of of a, of a Christian spiritual life. Do not resent, do not react, and keep inner stillness. Now. Um, if you want to key those to the Philokalia, it would be Hezekiah, Nepsis, and uh, uh, Apothia. Um, uh, stillness, or silence, uh, watchfulness, and dispassion. Because those, those are what those uh, categories encompass. And you need all three. Um, 
because spiritual life is a process. And it's a process of purification of, and of illumination, and thus it becomes the process of deification. In, in orthodoxy, everything is about process. It's not about... Um, there's nothing instant. It's, uh, it's not like... Uh, we go from the state of the damned to the saved just by, you know, saying our little prayer of um, repentance. It, that we've got to start someplace. That's all right, um, as a beginning. But um, but if you think that that you're saved as a result of saying the sinner's prayer, um, you're deluding yourself. In reality, you're deluding yourself um, because salvation is a process. We have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as St. Paul says. And that process is, um, is fraught with all sorts of temptations and trials. And that's good, because it's by trials and temptations that we work out our salvation. Um, uh, in, uh, there's an ancient monastic saying, without temptation there's no salvation. Because it's through working through those temptations that we learn how to overcome them and we learn how to uh, live a... Uh, uh, to not only to live the Christian life, but that we learn how to pray. And we learn how to pray in a focused manner that actualizes the process of repentance. Now, repentance... Is, is the basic context of our life. But repentance means, metania, metanoia, means transformation of the, of the, of the noose, transformation of the, of the spiritual awareness. Now noose, in this case, and to a great extent, really means, in English, consciousness. It's about the transformation of our consciousness. And the means of doing that is through the practice of uh, the Jesus prayer, through the practice of hesychasm. Um, and it's not just, and it's not simply changing our mind and turning, uh, turning away from um, our sinful past. It's about an actual transformation of of the very substance of our of our awareness, so that so that we refocus our awareness from being focused on ourself to being focused on God, so that we move from um, awareness through our senses to spiritual awareness, and um, and and through that. And through the, uh, the process of, of the illumination of our mind by grace, even our, spirit, even our senses become transformed so that we can begin to see spiritually and not just with the eyes of our heart but even with our, with our natural eyes to, to begin to see the uncreated light to begin to see God shining through the creation. This is what natural contemplation is. Um, and then eventually in the divine darkness to be able to begin to contemplate God, which is theology. Um so it's it's really about um, you know this ascent to God. Now these three points are very are all very important. Um, the context is repentance, um, and it's but it's this process of transformation, um, and so. Uh, when we look at the process, um, to start to start out with, um, we need we need to 
to begin with this process of, of purification. Process of repentance is purification and illumination. Um, leading to deification. It's the process of salvation. Um, And so the most important thing that we need to purify ourselves from um, certainly is uh, is our resentments. In other words, it's the remembrance of wrongs. It's all of of the the pain and the anger and the passion um, that's been stored up in our minds, I won't say in our heart because that has another meaning, but it's stored up in our subconscious and is, a, is our reaction to offense, it's our reaction to being abused, it's our, re- it's our reaction to pain, it's our reaction to the situations that we find ourselves in. Um, it's the reactions to other people, and and how they have, and the, how they have uh, very often hurt us, and it's our reactions to our own reactions, um, because very often it's not just the other person, the other people who hurt us; it's we often hurt ourselves, and so um, and so we have all of this stuff stored up in our subconscious. <coughs> And um, when we try and when we try and begin a a, a, a spiritual discipline, um, especially the discipline of um, of prayer, and especially a di- the discipline of contemplative prayer um, or silence, what happens is that at first you feel really good about yourself because you're getting spiritual, you think, you know, you're making progress, you know, it's very pleasant, you know, it's kind of nice and peaceful and quiet. Um, But then all of a sudden, you've got memories just vomiting up. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And you see every, and every image that you've ever seen, you know, the violent images, pornographic, all... Anything that you've seen, every um, on TV, on the mo- in the movies, you know, in your personal experience, you know, um, every every situation where somebody has abused you or hurt you, or <laughs> it all it's all in there, um, all the feelings, all of the all of the stored up anger, all of the stored up rage, all of the stored up hurt. You know, some people have have a lot of that. Some people have very little. Um, It depends on the kind of life you've lived before you started that discipline. Um, And so it takes a varied amount of time to work through all that stuff. Now, working through it means that you, you need to go through and you need to separate what was your what the other person did that's their pro, that which and that's their issue that's their problem there's nothing you can do about that and it's that's their problem with their confessor but your reaction to it <coughs> is your problem <laughs> and and um, so for example somebody really abuses us, you know, you know, verbally, even physically. And, and so obviously there's hurt, there's anger, there's all of these, these other reactions that we have to that, you know, there's being humiliated, there's being shamed, there's, you know, um, you name it. Um, and so how do we process that? At the root of all anger is hurt. And that's really that's really valuable to know. Hurt is there's nothing sinful about being hurt, but it's how we process it, whether it turns into sin or not. Because if we turn that hurt into hatred and judgment and slander and uh, gossip and um, and so forth, then 
okay, what that person did to us was wrong and it's inexcusable. Uh, but what we're doing <laughs> with it is also wrong and inexcusable. And we need to, and if we can take responsibility for that and confess it and repent of it, it's gone. And we're freed from it. Now, sometimes, you know, these, if it's, you know, if we were, you know, if it's been a long ongoing situation and, you know, uh, things like that, then that, then it takes a long time to work through all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I'm uh, personally speaking, I basically lived, had a really boring life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in that sense, I mean, I never got really, you know, no abuse, no nothing. Um, my girlfriend didn't even dump me in high school, you know. It's, I mean, it's not, not a big deal, you know. And it, it still took me six months to work through that stuff. Um, other people, it takes years. Um, and the Jesus Prayer works as a means of illuminating all of the stuff that we need to repent of. Now, so what happens? We begin to identify all this stuff. And we take it to, con- to confession. We confess it. And we receive absolution from it. It's like clearing out a garage that's packed full of stuff. If you've ever seen, if you've ever seen the house of a pack rat, <coughs> I mean, just everything is just literally packed in. I moved into a monastery in um, California, and there was a little path going through stacks and stacks and stacks of (coughs) furniture and boxes and newspapers and, you know, all interlaced with rat droppings and, I mean, just awful. Um, And it took a long time to get that cleaned out. (coughs) Um, So you walk into a garage... And all you see is this, the entire thing is packed from wall to wall and floor to ceiling of stuff. And you turn on the light and it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> okay. So, when, you're, when we're clearing out our consciousness like this, we, ta- uh, we, take, it, we take the stuff, we deal with the stuff, uh, we come to forgiveness, and and we not only and we have to renounce and detach. We have to renounce our judgment of the other person and detach from it, because otherwise we live lives as victims, and if we're victims then we're powerless. Um, But if we get rid of that victim mentality and start taking back power over our own lives instead of handing it to our abuser, which is what victimhood really does, um, then we can can get get rid of of this dross from the past. Um, now, sometimes um, we've been so beaten down that we define ourselves by this, you know, and that takes a lot of work. Still, it's absolutely.